The way of Jesus, uh, last week Cass uh, spoke powerfully on the kindness of the Lord, the love, the kindness, that he's a friend to sinners. Anyone here a sinner? <laughs> Who's the chief of sinners? <laughs> uh, where would we be without the kindness and the love of God? We would be going to a Christless eternity, not a nice place, but with the grace, the goodness, kindness of the Lord. He has saved us. And, uh, and when we decided to do this topic, they gave me the hardest one, the justice of the Lord of life. Not an easy topic. Um, because the moment you hear the word justice, you cannot help but think and feel and sense the terrible injustices that are within our world. And all of us, there's a yearning within us for justice to be at work, perfect justice. That can only be through Jesus Christ. But we live in a world that is filled with pain and suffering, evil and uh, unbelievable injustices. But he is the justice of the Lord of life. And there's some interesting scriptures that um, when Jesus is introduced as a actually before he's born, Mary and Zechariah and, and uh, make these statements. Mary's song, uh, listen, read these words with me. This is Mary's song about Jesus. She's pregnant. And this is the prophetic song that comes out. He, the God of the Old Testament, shows mercy from generation to generation. Yeah. To all who fear him, he shows mercy. In spite of pain, suffering and evil and injustice, our God is merciful and, and uh, the Old Testament's full of this. You can read about it. His mighty arm has done tremendous things from Genesis to Malachi. She's reflecting, Mary saying, but God is good in spite of what's happening around about us. He has scattered the proud and haughty ones. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. Hey, she's really saying... Evil and injustice does not win in the long term. No evil dictator, no murdering scoundrel ever survives. And you think of, of, of history, both biblical history and church history, all the monsters that gain political power, government power, they're all hated. They never win. They do a lot of evil, but they never win through. God ultimately gets rid of them. And, uh, but they, they still inflict a lot of... A lot of horrible things in our world and uh, he has brought down he scatters the proud and the haughty ones and he has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble and so she's saying this is what what God is like interesting Zechariah his words about Jesus this is the the daddy of John the Baptist and uh, he says this then then his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and gave this prophecy about Jesus Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and redeemed his people. He says, hey, God's visiting the planet. <laughs> He's going to start the great reversal of the injustices that, that prevail in our world. God himself's going to turn up. He has sent us a mighty saviour from the royal line of his servant David, just as he prophesied through his holy prophets long ago. Now, now, there's help for today. And there is hope for tomorrow. Now we will be saved from our enemies and from all who hate us. So he is very hopeful in this sin-soaked world that we live in. And remember, in this era, there was a monster ruling Palestine. His name was Herod. And he was a bad man. He had his wife murdered. He had sons murdered. He would kill you if you looked at him the wrong way. He was like a Hitler, Mussolini, Tojo, all thrown in one. And so there was lots of evil. He, would, at times, would just kill a bunch of Jews just to, to feel good. He was an Edomite. He wasn't a Jew. And the Romans had put him in there. The Roman colonizers put him in there so that everyone would fear him. And, and he would take the heat rather than the Roman governors. So there's a lot of evil taking place in, in that era. <laughs> and I love what Isaiah says in, in Matthew 12, one of my favorite passages, actually, and, uh, and in Matthew 12, when Jesus is ministering 
And it says, oh, Matthew goes, this is, this is to fulfill what Isaiah predicted, that God's answer to the problem of pain and suffering and evil and injustice in the world is Jesus. The world is full of this rubbish that can destabilize you and upset you. But Jesus is the answer. And it's, he says, he, t- he quotes Isaiah, he goes, look at my servant whom I have chosen. Jesus is chosen by God the Father. And, and God loves us so much that he sent him to start the great reversal of injustice and pain and suffering and evil because God hates it. The Garden of Eden was never like that. Read the end of the book, Heaven. There's an image of like the Garden of Eden. Satan, sin, evil, pain, suffering, sickness, death is all going to be removed. And so he sends Jesus to start the great reversal, but to do it the right way, the right order. He is my beloved who pleases me, and I'll put my spirit upon him. He says, Jesus is obedient. He pleases me. The eternal son becomes Jesus of Nazareth and and the father loved him. And every so often the father in heaven would would part heaven and and peer down and say, this is my boy, I love him. Uh, He's so obedient. Two or three times in in the New Testament, God the father can't contain himself. Like he's saying, people, do you realize I've sent you the best, the eternal son, Jesus. He's my boy, I love him. He's obedient. And I've anointed him. I've given him the full measure of the Holy Spirit And he says, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. Wow. He started this. You see, Jesus spoke this. He demonstrated it. When you look at Jesus' life, and Cass beautifully introduced the series about the kindness of the Lord. But as I read the four Gospels, and I'm doing some intense reading and reflecting on, on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you cannot help but see God in action. You know what he's doing? He's pushing back evil. He's alleviating pain, suffering, sickness. And you get the feeling like, I wish I could do it to everyone right now. But I've got to start the right way. I've got to start with the inner life of a person in their relationship with God. Then ultimately everything else is going to be sorted out. And so Jesus among us can't help but push back evil, pain, suffering, evil, injustice. And wherever he saw it, he spoke against it. And uh, he, he spoke against injustice, and he and not just spoke against, he actually then alleviated suffering by his own presence and power and grace and kindness. That's why he, he healed people of physical illnesses. That's why he drove out evil spirits. That's why he, he healed the mentally ill. That's why he, he fed the poor and he calmed the storms. He's saying, I'm the Lord, because everything's going to get reversed. Even this confusion of storms and natural calamities, Ultimately, it's all going to be reversed. And the great reversal has begun by me visiting the planet. But I've got to die on a cross to start the process because the greatest issue is your relationship with God the Father. The issue of sin's got to be dealt with. The inner life before the outer and relational life can take place. So, he will not fight or shout or raise his voice in public. How's that? Jesus... His presence is going to be a non-coercive, non-violent approach of love. He's not going to force his will upon anyone. He's going to appeal to people to turn back to God, to face up to their responsibilities, to see that the issue of, of pain, sin, of evil, suffering actually starts because the human heart is so self-centered. Out of the heart come out all these things that lead to ugliness and wars. He says, I'm going to come and heal those hearts first. I'm going to restore you. So he's he's not going to fight or shout or raise his voice in public. He will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. Love is going to be his example. Not weakness. He wasn't weak. He was tough and strong. But non-coercive, non-violent love to persuade people to face up to their responsibility, to turn from themselves and their sin and to put their trust in him as the only saviour of humanity. Finally, he will cause justice to be victorious. I love that. And his name will be the hope of all the world. So Jesus has come to deal with the injustice issue in our world. And he deals with the total justice question. And his name will be the hope of all the world. Jesus is the answer for today and for tomorrow. They're great scriptures, aren't they? 
hopeful scriptures. And uh, there is a problem in our world. And we can't deny that. And I know people who, who just cannot handle to even, unless it happens to them, they say, I don't want to know about what's happening in society. I don't want to know what's happening in Syria at the moment. I don't want to know about pain and suffering and evil. I just want to live my life and endeavour to find some happiness. Don't talk to me about eight Aussies killing themselves every day. Twice the number of road deaths. A dear friend of mine ended his life nearly 10 years ago and there were seven Aussies killing themselves every day. Now there's eight. The federal government, the state governments, the medical authorities have poured in billions of dollars. It hasn't solved the problem. They're trying. There's something really wrong with, with the human condition. There, there's, there's, there's terrible problems abound where people have got no hope. So we say, oh, don't talk to me about that. We need to talk about it. Yeah. We need to face it and say, you know what? There's got to be an answer. And we say the answer is Jesus Christ. And connectivity, being connected in a loving community. I saw an interview yesterday, and I've actually got the title of the book of this guy who, who was bound, terribly brilliant young man from, from England who has severe mental illness and started on medication all the way through. And he's not anti-medication. He's actually for psychiatrists and doctors, all that stuff. But he said, you know, he goes, I've come across why it's increasing. And he looked at his own life and he said, the surveys reveal it. In the United States and Australia, I think it's 35, 40 years ago, if you were in trouble, you had at least five people to go to. Today, Aussies are saying, and Americans, let's get this, if you're in trouble in the US, you have no one to go to. In Australia, you have one person. That's what the survey says. Hey, People feel incredibly alone. And he says loneliness is such a huge issue. Disconnectedness. And he's saying that part of the answer, he goes, part of the answer is that people need connectivity. They need also, and interesting what he was saying, he says, they've got to get into a group where they start doing good to others, like one in 10. I'm thinking, are you a Christian man? He's like, he's preaching, but he says, you, you, you've got to somehow, he goes, we need connectivity. We need to be involved with other people and start doing acts of kindness. And the focus comes off ourselves onto others. And he goes, that's wonderful medication. He says, he says, I'm not against medication like at certain times. He goes, but there's greater medications. Connectivity, love, acceptance, relationship. And I'm thinking, this guy is coming up with some answers in his research at how to combat the cursed influence of the rising tide of mental illness that knows no bounds. And people destroying their own lives as well. I thought, wow, I'm going to read his book. I'll give it to a few people to read. And he might be a believer, I don't know, but I'm thinking, hey, there, there are answers. Jesus is the answer. The church is the answer. It really is. If you took the church out of the world today, the world would go to hell in a handbasket. Most of the humanitarian, social, good work, schools, hospitals, prison support, Alleviation of suffering, homes, food, clothes, is actually the Christian church in action. Don't listen to the propaganda of, 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 an, of a hostile media. The reality is the church is doing Jesus' work, is pushing back the bounds of injustice and evil and suffering and doing a whole pile of good within our world. I think it's the Uniting Church in, South, in Australia has more social workers employed than all the governments put together. Just one denomination. That's what I heard. Whether it's local government, state government, they have more people involved in social care and services. Wow. Salvation Army. What they do. Amazing. Take them out of the picture. And what, where would our society be? So the church is Jesus' body. And as he started to push back and to deal with injustice and evil and pain and suffering, 
Until he comes and wraps everything up, the church is to be Jesus' eyes, arms, and, and to actually be part of the answer. And it has been for 2,000 years. I'm so proud of the church of Jesus Christ. You might say, well, what about the sins? Yeah, of course. It's made up of imperfect people. I'm not going to join a church because, because you know, it, it's imperfect. Every organisation's imperfect. School sector, there are teachers that are imperfect. You've got judiciary that are imperfect. You've got doctors that are imperfect. You've got politicians. Of course you have that human sin. And people taking advantage of one another and abusing power. That, that's a reality, you know. That's part of the symptom of sin and injustice. But Jesus is the answer to it. In his personal life, he demonstrated it. And he's saying, if you're a Christ follower, he goes, don't just pray, when I return, I'm going to wrap everything up. You now be part of the answer. Push it back where you are, in your family, in your community, where you see an injustice, where you see evil. Endeavour to do good. So here's a question that's raised oftentimes. It's one that I, I, I deal with constantly. If God is totally good, listen to this carefully, and he's totally just and fully in control, how come our world is in such a mess? It's one of the toughest questions of all, and no one can give a totally satisfactory answer because there is so much trouble and evil in our world. I mean, you may not like watching the television about what's happening in Syria, but if you want to know what hell is like, within seven years, a beautiful country, a heavenly country in many respects, beautiful place, has been turned into a living hell. Half its population, imagine half of Australia can no longer live in their own homes. Just think about that. Your beautiful home, you can't live there. You've got to take off and go to Kangaroo Island to survive. Or Lord forbid, to Victoria. <laughs> Millions of them. In Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, Iraq, they've just fled from their homes. Just that. Okay? And then you've had, out of a population the size of Australia, nearly 600,000 people killed. Wow! Wow! It's not just the physical destruction. It's like, it's almost saying, you don't believe there's a devil? You don't believe there's evil? Look at Syria. And then I, watched a, I watch a news program in the morning at night. A good news program. Not fake news, good news. <laughs> and I saw this terrible story of a little Muslim girl in northern India. You may have seen it yourself. And they showed a photo of a beautiful little, just reminded me of one of my grandkids, beautiful little eyes. And, and uh, a group of fanatical, crazy Hindu people took her, locked her up, and just did the unmentionable, because of kids here, for three or four days. And they killed her. Police arrested these monsters. How do you give yourself over to such evil? <laughs> you know, the mind boggles. And then... The police have arrested them and the community's risen up saying, no, we're going to defend them. So there are people, people like us defending the indefensible. I'm thinking, how, how, this, is, this is human evil. This is, this is pain. I mean, I tried to put myself into that position. If it was my granddaughter, if it was my daughter, it, it, it's their life wreckers. The people of Syria, this is real, it's happening. Because we live in such a blessed country here, we can sometimes get immune, even as Christians, but we need to get engaged because Jesus says just, he's into justice. He wants to, to fight back injustice. We've got to do it the right way, not the wrong way. And uh, we, we take for granted the liberties and freedoms that we have. You know, people complain about our parliamentary system and, <laughs> you know, why do, they, why do they argue? Why can't they just hold hands and sing Kumbaya across the line? Well... <laughs> The great Paul Keating said this, he goes, he goes, the parliament's the bullpen. Argue your case. And as Prime Minister says, I'm going to destroy your argument. And he did it viciously. <laughs> and people were reeling and he had such a huge sense of humour. Got a bit grubby at times, but you know what he was like. 
And he says, what's the alternative? Get guns and bayonets and we start killing each other because we have a difference of opinion? Because this is the mark of civilization that we can discuss and talk and agree to disagree agreeably and do it and let the people decide every three years who they agree with. We take that for granted in so many countries. Someone's got another opinion, kill them. We have a blessed country, folks, but don't be blinded to the reality of pain, suffering and evil, even in our midst. That's why I mentioned the statistics regarding suicide. They're horrendous. And there's got to be an answer, and I think the only answer is, is Jesus and connectivity of people getting connected with people. Even if the illness doesn't lift, at least there's people to support and help and, and love and, and, and embrace people. It's one of the toughest questions of all. All philosophies, all religions, all worldviews try their best to say, hey, what's the cause of this? But they all fall short to give an explanation. You know, I studied religion for four years at university. Wonderful to study all the different religions. And there's some good things in them. But I tell you, they all have inadequate explanations for the concept of evil. Buddhism comes closest where they talk about Tanga. And Tanga is the concept of evil desire. And that uh, the Gautama, Prince Gautama, who founded, it wasn't a religion, it was a philosophy, an Indian chap. And um, he basically said, no, there's something wrong. He goes, it's evil desire, self-centeredness, people's greed. But he never came up with, a, he never had a theological answer. Where did it come from? What's the cause of this thing? Of why is the human heart bent towards doing the wrong thing? Why don't we learn from history? They banned chemical weapons after the First World War, internationally. And they said any nation, any person that does, does them is going to break the law internationally. In 1924 they signed it because a million people were gassed to death in the First World War. Saddam Hussein gassed the, the, the Kurds. Five, six thousand men, women and children. Now there's other monsters gassing people. I don't know the rightness and wrongness of, of the United States, Britain and France bombing the living daylights out of Syria. I don't, know the, I, I, I don't like it. The only thing I'm thankful for is it seems like nobody was killed. They blew up all the chemical factories. And I thought, well, you know what? Probably just this year they're saying, in this imperfect world, we've got to have some law. So if you want to make chemical weapons and use them, it goes, we'll destroy them. So something within us, I don't know about you, think, well, that's probably just but I don't understand enough, but it's just a symptom of, of where our world is at. And we look in and think, gee, I hope they know what they're doing. All I know is I just pray. I pray for them. I've prayed more for this American president than all the others put together. <laughs> don't criticize him. Pray for him. <laughs> He's a wild boy at 72. And, uh, and I just pray, God, somehow use him to do good. Because <laughs> He's totally unpredictable. Frightens the living daylights out of all the enemies. One of the North Koreans is scampering, saying, yeah, 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 we'll denuclearize. <laughs> we'll get rid of all of our uh, stuff. So I think maybe good's going to come out. Maybe God's got a sense of humor. I'll put somebody in there that can solve some of these problems. Pretty flawed personality, but maybe he'll get some things done. I don't know. Tell you what, it's entertaining though, isn't it? <laughs> you know what's going to happen tomorrow? Forget all the reality shows. The White House reality shows, number one. Uh, so, so this problem, you know, let me nail this down because it is an issue. And I think we as believers, I don't know your circles, but the circles that I certainly talk with people, this is the question is, if God is good, if he's just, if he's loving and kind, how come he allows, if he's in full control, how come he allows this to happen? And the devil's using this. It's, 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 a, tricky, it's a tricky thing to, to blind people from understanding the truth of what happened. And as I said, all religions and philosophies don't have an adequate answer. I believe that the biblical, Judeo-Christian perspective is the most reasonable, the most logical, and the most consistent view. And it squares up with the reality of how our world operates. The Bible honestly deals with the problem of pain, suffering, and evil and injustice. It's very honest about it. But it also talks about the world that we live in 
is also filled with so much good and love and hope. And we tend to focus on that only and want to turn a blind eye to the other. So the world is full of hope and goodness and love and life and there's lots of, I, I enjoy life, I love life. I enjoy living a loving life and a giving life and a good life. There's nothing wrong with that. As long as we don't blind ourselves from the reality of what the experience of so many people in our world and including in Australia is. And so, you know, the Judeo-Christian framework is this, is that, and I make a couple of points, is one is the price of freedom is the possibility of evil. Simple little statement, you may want to write it down. The price of freedom is the possibility of evil. And you've got to read the Genesis story, Genesis 1, 2, and 3. It's the best explanation yet of origins. Nothing comes close to it. Magnificently written. God trying to explain to us that he is good and loving and kind and he wanted earth to be like heaven, a reflection of heaven. But he didn't create people to be robots. Program, 6 o'clock in the morning, up we get, I love God, I will serve God. I will do the right thing to everyone. Like, like, there's no pleasure in God, the creator, in making machines. He made you a living, breathing human being, free to choose, free to love. People say, oh, you know, why didn't he make us so that we couldn't sin? Then we'd be robots. Or why doesn't God just wipe out sin now? How much sin do you want him to wipe out? How many of you would survive? (laughs) Hey? It's merciful. It's a mercy that he doesn't wipe out sin now because I wouldn't survive and neither would you. Actually, we would if, if the blood of Christ covers us. But you see, there are arguments that are emotionally based that are not really reasonable and sound and there's not a theological framework to underpin why. And we need to have this. Now, it is a logical argument, and I'll talk about the empathic and, and emotional argument, which is even more powerful in many respects. But you see, the price of freedom is the possibility for evil. The preciousness of our freedom also creates the potential for us to do evil. And the book of Genesis paints both the positive and negative, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. God, our loving Heavenly Father, wants our worship and obedience to be voluntary if it's to have any real meaning and value. This is what is to be human, is to be free. What's the alternative? No freedom of thought, no freedom of will, no freedom of conscience, created to be mindless, emotionless robots. That's not being a human being. And in Genesis chapter 3, it clearly tells us why there is human evil in our world. How come injustice came in? And so the question as to why... The why of human evil must be directed to people and not to God. That's the faulty premise. If we understand the biblical story, it's not why, oh God, do you allow it? It's why, oh man, did you choose to hurt your loving creator and break all the rules and then to wound your fellow man and keep wounding your fellow man and then ultimately to harm and diminish yourself? It's a false notion and certainly not a biblical one that God controls everything that happens in the world. And there's a theological position that says, yeah, God controls everything. He created Satan. He created evil. And almost like then Jesus came to sabotage God's control. Hey, that's weird and wacky. We don't have a Muslim view of God that everything is predetermined and everything is his will. That's a faulty view of God. That's not the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I've read the Quran. They've taken bits of the Old Testament, bits of the New, and uh, and kind of what their their view is of of a fatalistic, deterministic God. He's the author of good and evil, and and everything that happens is his will. Even what happened to that little girl in India. That's his will? Give me a break. That's the devil's will. That's human evil being cut loose and justice demands that those perpetrators be arrested and tried and dealt with and if the state fails then God won't fail on judgment day the Christian worldview is not deterministic or fatalistic 
blind, unthinking determinism is just awful. God does not control everything that happens to the tiniest of details. He doesn't. God cannot do evil. God cannot sin. And there are lots of things that happen in our world that are just not good things. And God doesn't like it and he hasn't wanted it and it was never part of his plan in the beginning. If it was, why the picture of Eden? Why the picture of the new heaven, new heavens and new earth without all that stuff? Why did Jesus combat evil and suffering and pain wherever he could in three years? As much as he could in person. Second thing I want to say is history reveals that good ultimately triumphs over evil. Now, oftentimes I wish it was quicker. Man, I studied the Second I used to teach history. And I studied the Second World War. And Adolf Hitler, was the, if anyone was the personification of Satan in human history, it would have been Hitler. It's not an exaggeration. The kind of deviancy, and he was directly responsible for the murder, the killing of 60 million people. 60 million people perished from 1939 actually before then, to 1945. And if he had his will, he would have killed every Russian, Ukrainian, Slavic person up to the Urals, another 80 million people. He wrote that in Mein Kampf in 1922 when he was put in prison. He would have killed all the Slavic people because he thought they were subhuman. Like the Jews were subhuman, the gypsies were subhuman, homosexuals were subhuman, the mentally ill were subhuman. Did you realise they bumped off the mentally ill? Euthanasia? They bumped off the physically impaired. They bumped off the gypsies. They bumped off the homosexuals. Anyone didn't quite fit. Terrible. This is before the Second World War. You know, I wish somebody put a bullet in him in 1935. I wish one of those assassination attempts worked. They tried many times. What a terrible thing to say as a Christian pastor. I wish somebody was dead. Actually, what I'm saying is he should have been executed and dealt with because he's so violating God. And there was a Christian pastor named Dietrich Bonhoeffer that was part of the plot in 1944 to have him eliminated, along with Klaus von Stauffenberg. If you want to see a great film, see Val Cree with Tom Cruise. True story. And Stauffenberg was a Catholic man. And Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran pastor. The German high command, they wanted to ultimately get rid of him. And if they did in 1944, another 20 million people would have been saved. So I struggle with that. I still do to this day. God, why did you allow? Why did you allow? Why didn't somebody put an end to this monster? I don't understand. I don't have an answer, except I know that good ultimately triumphs. Hitler's name is the personification of evil, and he will be despised for generations. Bonhoeffer, who was hardly known, and the final act of Hitler's evil, as he was about to commit suicide, he says, hang all the prisoners. This beautiful 39-year-old, brilliant man, I hung him with piano wire in a prison. Just days before the Americans and Russians came. Bumped off a whole pile of Germans. Then he wrote in his testament, as he's about to do himself in, the German people weren't worthy of me. That's his testament. You weren't worthy of me. That's the devil speaking, isn't it? You're not, you read Hitler's testimony. You weren't worthy of me after what he decimated his people. Wow. But he failed. He lost. Righteousness won through. Every dictator, from Julius Caesar to Napoleon Bonaparte, to Adolf Hitler, to Lenin, Mao Zedong, all of them have bit the dust and they are despised. Good ultimately wins. So God doesn't control all events, but he will not let human beings ultimately destroy the earth. He is king, he is Lord, and you can't push him too far. Just read the Bible, the Old Testament. So the God of the Bible is in charge of the big picture, even though he doesn't control everything. He gave us freedom and we must bear the consequences and take responsibility for our lives and for the choices that we make. God has restrained himself for a time so that human history can be what it is, an enterprise involving freedom and responsibility. So we are not totally free to do what we want. We are free to do the right thing. 
towards God and towards man and towards ourselves. God's sovereignty and human responsibility are not two equal truths that counterbalance each other. God's sovereignty and his will and purpose always comes first, even if it means our human freedom may be limited. So a Hitler will not ultimately win. Islamic fascists will not ultimately win. The Assad family in Syria are not ultimately going to win. God limits evil and he steers the long-term course of history. So human autonomy and freedom is not absolute, as is God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty is absolute. Hey, look, let me read a couple of scriptures now on those two points. Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things God works, say it with me, for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. He's not saying that all things are good. Some things are downright awful and plainly evil and unjust. But God is always working for our long-term good. God's patience has limits and he does interfere with human history. The story of Joseph in Genesis is, is a great story. The brothers planned to kill him. It nearly worked. But God used the brother's evil. He didn't cause it. And he did a work in Joseph's heart to ultimately save the world because of a huge famine that took place. Amazing story. The United States today. I mean, for those of you that are not history buffs, you're missing out on life. The United States in the 20th century and 21st century is the premier nation. It doesn't matter who the president is. I mean, it's like, without the US, we'd all be speaking German, Japanese, Italian, be, have a hammer, hammer and sickle over our flags. I mean, there's no question. The US has beaten up all these tyrants from World War I, World War II, Cold War, and now Islamic fascism. It is. That's why Australia's locked in with America in an alliance. If America goes to war, we go to war, whether we like it or not. That's why we pray that they stay righteous. But you know, the American, uh, the American nation nearly fell apart. You read the American Civil War, 1861 to 1865. I went to Gettysburg several years ago. The great battle that took place in three days, July the 1st, 2nd and 3rd of 18, 20, uh, 1863. And I could not believe when I went to little round top, this little hill, I'd heard about it at the end of the great line where the Union armies were fighting and the Confederate armies, the, the Southerners, and, and somebody said, the Southerners are coming. This is the first time that the South invaded the North. The Southern armies were invaded the North, just north of Washington. If they beat the Union armies, that's it. No more United States. They would have split up into a whole pile of different countries. So I went there. And Little Round Top is like a little round top, little hill. On a, on, a, on a sort of a hilly area and then the, the enemy was on the other side and a, a New York general said hey they're moving to the south they're going to come around us so they said okay who do we send they sent general no, so he was Colonel Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain you can check it out on Google most times Google tells the truth <laughs> amazing story he's a Christian man he's a professor He's in his 30s. He's a professor. His wife says, I don't want you going to war. because I'm going to go. I feel God's telling me to go to war. So he and his Maine, from Maine, way up north, he and his boys, 300 of them, race up the little round top. And of course, the southerners are hiding behind the trees. And so there then, it was a slaughter. As the southerners are coming up, bang, 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 they just killed so many. They ran out of bullets. And they're still coming. What does he do? He has this crazy thought. He's a Christian man. He says, boys, bayonets. We're going down the hill. He goes, little round top, and he goes like this. Just all line up, at 300 of them, and then we're going to go like this, a pincer movement. Shh. So what they did, they put their bayonets on without bullets, and when the southerners came up, they just charged and screamed like crazy people. The southern army was so frightened, they all go, oh, put their hands up, and they won the battle on that second day, July the 2nd, 1863. And the next day, they reckon 
that if Colonel Chamberlain, who became general and then he became governor of Maine, if he didn't do that, the Union armies would have been destroyed, Washington would have been taken, no more United States, where would the 20th and 21st century be? Hey, one man, one action. Could God be in that? Of course he could. There's no question. See the film Dunkirk. They didn't tell us that Prime Minister Churchill asked all the churches to pray. And what happened? Overcast weather. Hitler's bombers couldn't see the men. And 300,000 British soldiers were rescued and that became the foundation of the great British armies of the Second World War. History is his story. And though evil occurs, he will ultimately cause good to come out of it. So when, when, that's why I love reading history, because you think, you know what, I think God's in, in this thing. Even though there's a lot of evil, a lot of the devil's work, but God's actually outworking things. Guys, you may be going through some really difficult times. God is in control and will cause good to come, but he's not, he's not the cause of the evil and the pain and the suffering and the injustice you're facing. To me, the most satisfying answer to this, this is the third point, I think the most important. The most satisfying answer comes when I reflect on Jesus. As Cass shared about the kindness of the Lord last week, when I read the four Gospels and I see the justice of Jesus, how he outworked, but you know, not just what he said and did, but his passion. Because half the Gospels center on the final week of his life. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. There's no other biographies written where the death of a person takes up half the book. In fact, in one gospel, it's probably the final day and a half is probably a third of the book of one of the gospels. Because when I'm personally dealing with pain and suffering in my own life and that of my family, or when I have to confront evil, um, when I have to confront evil, um, I, I, I will go crazy if I don't keep my focus on Jesus. There was one time when a man, he wasn't part of our church, but of a family outside the church, they weren't Christians, but I was ministering to the family and he was, I discovered that he was beating his wife. And then when the marriage ended, he actually kicked her while she was pregnant. He beat her and was kicking her while she's pregnant. I hit the roof. I just lost it. I jumped in my car, went after him. I don't know what I would have done when I found him, but I was so, and, and I went to a club where he was, thankfully he wasn't there. Afterwards, and I was driving back, I said, Bill, what are you doing? What could have happened? I don't know, I was so angry. The injustice of it just filled me with rage that I wanted to, I wanted to give him a laying on of hands ministry but not in Jesus' name, in Billy Vasilakis' name, I tell you. <laughs> and, and it just dawned on me, I'm saying, Bill, you know, that would be great. Senior minister, Christian families, arrested for assault, put in jail. Yeah, great. Like, and it just taught me to say, you know what? That's not the way of Jesus, vengeance. It's non-coercive, non-violent love. It's not weakness. But Jesus has said the state is the means by which justice can be outworked police, courts, governments, even Caesar. And if that doesn't work, ultimately, God's justice, even those who think they're going to get away, they won't get away with it. So he's taken the sword out of our hearts. We've got to follow his example. Non-violent, non-coercive love. So I love Martin Luther King Jr. celebrating his 50th year where he was murdered. And I was 14 years of age when they killed him in 1968. Wonderful man, Baptist minister. Tough as nails, but non-violent love. And I mean, he is, he is a hero today to the United States. Black, white, and some of his speeches are just magnificent. Not just the, I have a dream speech, but a whole pile of others. Like, like, and, and his statements about Jesus are so good. I, I know there's a man, um, I won't mention his name, he's a famous atheist in Australia, and, and, uh, but he says, my passion in life is to overturn injustice. And the older he gets, the more twisted he becomes. And it's actually, it's like he's been transformed and that he is starting to resemble what he's resenting. 
He's so full of resentment over all the evil, the pain. And, and I think it's twisting him. And you know what? Without Jesus, we'll get twisted if we have to confront evil in our own strength. Because it's just, it drives you crazy. And so that's why when I'm personally dealing with pain and suffering and having to confront evil, which I do, I have to turn to Jesus. And this is the final thing, that Jesus is the suffering, sacrificial servant saviour. And he reveals the perfect justice of God. He identifies folks with your humanness and all the pain and all the suffering and all the evil that you have to go through. He identifies with it. Romans 5 says this, you see at just the right time when we were still powerless, when we were helpless and hopeless, without hope, Christ died for the ungodly, for you, for me. We didn't deserve it. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we've now been justified, made right with God by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath, condemnation and judgment through him? You see, the great reversal starts with our relationship with him. If we start with trying to deal with the injustice between people, you might work for a period of time, but unless your own sin is dealt with and your relationship with God is restored and you become a believer in Jesus and put your trust in him, and then his peace and life starts to neutralize the toxic attitudes within our own heart and keep the beast within, as Johnny Cash would sing, the beast within us would rise and we need the Holy Spirit, his presence to keep that beast, that sinful nature under control under Jesus' control, then we can start working on human relationships. Jesus starts with the right order of humans' relationship with God, and then that should spin over into their personal lives and then their relational life, and then it'll affect communities and nations. Have a look at the scripture, the final one. But we see Jesus. <laughs> oh, do you see Jesus? The writer of Hebrews says, but we see him who was made a little lower than the angels, the condescension. He was God of very gods, the eternal son. Now he came to earth and he died for our sins, but now we see him crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. He suffered amazing indignities. He identified with us to say, no, no, I'm, I'm actually going to go through this what you don't have to go through because I love you and I want to take the sword of vengeance out of your heart. I want the issue of sin dealt with, your relationship with God, and then start doing good to your fellow human beings through my presence. And ultimately, there'll be a spin-off effect. And as I said, the Christian church has had a positive salting, lighting effect upon our world. But ultimately, he's going to return. So whenever I'm, I'm hung up regarding this problem of pain, suffering and evil and injustice, I've got, I, I've got to see Jesus. And some of you need to see him afresh today because you're being troubled by some things. And you go crazy. You won't have an answer unless you focus back on him. Let's stand together.